Hi everyone, I'm Eileen from Raycraft Books and welcome back to Magic Mirror Night. I hope you've all had a chance to take a listen to The Tomb of Time with Marco and Miranda. If not, go to our Raycraft Books YouTube channel and catch up on this great adventure with Marco and Miranda as they try to stop an evil emperor who wants to live forever, and he'll do anything to anyone that gets in his way. So tonight, we are going to be reading The Wall of Willows, which is a continuation of The Tomb of Time. Though you can read the books in the Magic Mirror series in any order, we thought these were the best two to start with. So join us tonight for the first couple of chapters, and let us know what you think. Here we go. The Heavenly River, Chapter One. The thing about having magicians to tea is that you never know what to feed them. And sometimes it's not just a question of deducing what they might eat, but finding out whether they eat at all. Some apparently don't, and others claim to eat very strange things indeed, foods not easily obtainable at local markets. Where would you find a pound of marinated dragon's tongues, for example? These matters were always a concern when the emperor was due to meet Anki Sheng, a thousand-year-old magician who, thankfully, didn't visit very often. So thought Choi Aling, the palace chief of staff, who was standing in a corridor of the palace, feeling very nervous indeed. The reference to this being a concern should, of course, not indicate that it was a concern to the emperor himself, who never worried about anything. No. His imperial majesty's job was to conjure up utterly impossible goals. Everyone else's job was to worry about how to achieve them. Choi tapped gently again on the bedroom door and shuddered, for it was a gloomy, windy, strangely dark mid-morning, and the rain fell diagonally, thrumming its fingers on the oak window shutters. The emperor had told his staff he was due to meet the magician for a meal today, but had given no instructions as to where, when, or how. Get his favorite food, the emperor had growled just before he went to bed, leaving no clue as to what that might be. This made it difficult to get things right, and if you didn't get things right, you were put to death. For the emperor was that sort of emperor, the sort who handed out death sentences whenever he was the slightest bit inconvenienced. Chief of Staff Choi tapped on the door again. Still, no answer. He would have to open the door and stick his head in, but that would be dangerous. Easily a reason to be executed. He heard a noise behind him. It was Ah To, a junior housemaid. The old man turned to her. Ah To, please open his Imperial Majesty's door and look inside. I want to know if he is awake. The young housemaid looked stricken. She knew that she may have just been given a death sentence, but that was how it was in the palace. When there was selfishness and wickedness at the top, then those qualities spread down through the staff like cane syrup trickling down the shaved mountain ice that the emperor liked to eat. The housemaid knew it would be foolish to refuse. So she closed her eyes, said a quick prayer, knocked twice, waited for the answer that never came, and then opened the door. There was silence inside. The room was quite dark. No candles were lit, although the curtains had been drawn on one side. Letting in the gray rain, cloud-filtered light. 
She scanned the room and saw the empty bed and messed up bedclothes. He's gone, she whispered. The chief of staff pushed her out of the way and poked his head into the room. That's impossible, he said. That fat old fool can barely walk to his bathroom these days, he added to himself under his breath. In fact, the fat old fool couldn't walk at all. He lay on his back on some sort of Roman style lounge chair on a ship. He had no idea how he got there, but he knew that he would never leave this spot. His time was over. He couldn't move and his limbs felt as though they would never work again. He was a clay statue, hardening, a pain, dark and dangerous was crawling around in his body. I have been poisoned, he said in a gasp to the man hovering nearby. Can you help me? Anki Sheng turned and looked at him. No one can help you except yourself, he said. His mind spinning, Emperor Qi Sheng Wang dimly recognized the musician the magician, and the mystery of how he got onto a chair on the deck of a boat was resolved. Whenever he met this man, all predictability seemed to vanish and reality, reality itself became bendable. I have done great evil, the emperor sighed. Now I must pay. My time has come. You have done great evil. That is certainly true, said Anki Sheng, his face expressionless. The magician, as usual, was dressed in curiously formed clothes made from materials the Emperor of Qin had never seen before. I've killed hundreds. Thousands, the magician corrected. I have lied and cheated and stolen and murdered but I've done good too. I have unified all lands under heaven, except the distant ones where only savages live. I have fed my people, the ones who obey me at least. Sheng, who was wearing a checkered jacket and leather patches on his elbows, said nothing. The emperor sighed again, losing his defensiveness. No need to weigh my good deeds and bad deeds in the balance. I know that my bad deeds greatly outweigh the good. Moving his arm with great difficulty, he picked something out of his teeth. This is true of all men and women, the magician said with a shrug, slowly walking to the edge of the ship and looking out into the distance. To seek forgiveness is a step all must take. After a moment's silent contemplation, the emperor spoke again, I'm dying. Are you taking me somewhere to die? I want to show you the Han, the Han, the heavenly river, the Milky Way. King Xin Wang's brow nodded. How did I get here? No, never mind. Who poisoned me? The magician turned and looked to him, but said nothing. I know, the emperor said, lowering his eyes. I poisoned myself, right? Anki Sheng continued to stare without speaking. The emperor laid his head back and in a dreamy wavering voice answered his own question. I told the court alchemist to make me an elixir of life or I would put them to death. So what choice did I give them? Having no way of making me what I demanded, they instead made an elixir that ended my life and saved their own. What a fool I've been. King Xing Wang used his thick fingers to feel for the gold chain around his neck. A small vial was attached to it. He swirled the tiny bottle around. It was filled with mercury, that magical silvery metal that flowed like water. The leader of my palace, alchemist, sorcerer Zhu Fu, told me to drink a cup of mercury every day. 
inhale mercury vapors every night and mix mercury into my meats. He said this was the recipe for eternal life. Shang gave him a half smile. Perhaps it is, he said, but not for you. By killing you, your beloved people will live on. Your death may give them life. I've been a fool, the emperor repeated. How long do I have to live? Anki Shang looked at the torpid man lying on the couch. The ruler was barely 50, but looked far older. Not weeks, not even days, a matter of hours. The face of the ruler of King fell and then became animated. He tried to sit up, but failed. Instead, he reached out his hand. You must help me, Sheng. Before I die, there is one thing I have to do. Last week at the command of Zhao Gao, the grand eunuch who was just appointed himself chancellor, I wrote a death paper for my oldest son, Fusu. It orders him to kill himself or allow the army to do it for him. For years, I thought of his soft heart. I thought his soft heart would be the ruination of the empire. That's what Zhao told me again and again. But in recent days, as I became sick, I realized that I had everything backward. I have always had everything backward. The magician continued to listen in silence. The dying monarch continued. Last night, in a fit of remorse, I wrote a letter countermanding that order. I want him to live. I want Fusu to be emperor. Do you hear me? I have written a letter countermanding the death paper I had written for my eldest child. It instead makes him my heir. My black-haired people need a leader with a heart. The world's people need a leader with a heart. I have given the letter to General Meng Yi to deliver to Fusu. The magician looked concerned. But how will that paper beat the other one to its goal? The one which has already been issued. You may be too late. This is true, but there is a chance. He may not act on the first one. What do you mean? Because no paper is valid without the seal of the emperor and the death paper has not been stamped. Where is the seal? I keep it where no one will ever find it or steal it. I keep it right here. The emperor of King pointed to his stomach. There are few things which surprise magicians, but this one caused Anki Sheng's eyebrows to rise. You have eaten it? He asked. I have not. You have had it surgically inserted into your body by physicians? No. But it is inside you. Right here. The emperor opened his garments to reveal an unattractive spotty white stomach made up of rolls of fat. Then he began counting them from the top. One two, three. He lifted up the third roll of fat and pulled out a small round container tucked inside. This is it. He twisted off the lid with some difficulty. The container was greasy and looked inside. There was nothing there. His jaw dropped open, his eyes bulged. I don't believe it. Someone has stolen my seal, but how could that be? The magician burst into laughter. The emperor watched him laugh and then raised both his hands to express puzzlement. That was me, actually, admitted Anki Shane. I saw the seal container by your bedside a week ago and decided to put the content somewhere more safe. Good thing, too. At this very moment, the entire palace is being combed inch by inch. Men loyal to your new chancellor, the grand eunuch, Zhao Gao, are looking for you. And the seal. I knew it was too valuable to leave it there. And I knew that you used it to validate commands that were not for the good of your people. As would Huai if it fell into his hands. The 
emperor winced at the name of his second son, the cruel, selfish one. And where is the seal now, he asked. Somewhere, somewhere neither the chancellor nor your younger son, who have become partners in crime, can reach it. You must have the seal delivered to General Meng Yi before Zhao Gao places the death paper into the hands of my oldest son. The magician scratched his chin, pondering. Then a slow smile spread across his face. I can try. I have two rather resourceful messengers who may be able to do that job. Chapter Two, Journeys Back in Time. Two children waited patiently outside the door of the classroom. The girl was hopping from foot to foot while the boy stared at the posters on the corridor wall. Inside, a middle-aged woman cleaned a whiteboard and switched off the computer. She stepped out and leaned, leaned down slightly to talk to them. She gave them an apologetic smile. I'm sorry, but we're gonna have to postpone our little chat. I know I promised, but something important has come up. Aw, said Marco, but we have something cool to show you. Yes, his sister Miranda added. It just arrived, but we don't know what it says. It's like some sort of ancient writing, I think. I'm so sorry, really, said Mrs. Sen. I've been summoned to a meeting with the school principal and the regional school inspector. It's a big deal. I suspect it may involve your wonderful performance in the history unit this semester. Let's meet tomorrow after school. We have history clubs scheduled for tomorrow anyway. We can discuss the ancient writing, if that's what it is, on the object you found. The children reluctantly turned for home. Three minutes later, Mrs. Sim was in the principal's office, grinning from ear to ear as she took her seat. Your school has performed remarkably well in the recent exams, the regional school inspector drawled, particularly in the history exam. We have, said the principal, better than any school in the district or in the whole country possibly, glad to hear it and far, far better than it has ever performed before. The inspector continued. He had the saddest face you ever saw, like a droopy-eared basset hound who had lost a winning lottery ticket. His voice was miserable too, and he sounded extremely unexcited about everything he said, even if it was something quite dramatic. It was a bit of a surprise, since your school has generally come near the bottom of the table. The principal nodded, his expression showing regret. That's also true. So that's why I've been sent. Mrs. Sim decided that this would be the right moment to show her school principal and the inspector exactly how humble she was. I have some wonderful students this year, so it's not due to any special teaching technique on my part, I can assure you. It's all down to the children themselves, 100%. The principal smiled at the inspector in agreement. Mrs. Sim is a very, very good teacher, of course, but she has never claimed to be the main driver behind this dramatic improvement in the school's performance in the history exams. It's the youngsters themselves. Now, if you're going to give us some sort of special prize, we need to know what, that's, what, what, what size it is. If if it's not too big, we can put it up in the glass case in front of the lobby, then every visitor will be able to see it. Prize, asked the inspector, looking puzzled. Yes, said the, the principal, for performing so well. The short, heavy visitor screwed up his lips. Oh, I'm not here to give you a prize. I'm here to check for irregularities. 
the improvement is so dramatic that the examinations board thinks there's a chance that something, um, something improper is going on. The principal's jaw dropped open. Mrs. Sim stopped breathing. There was silence for five uncomfortable seconds. Mrs. Sim recovered first. There's been no cheating, if that's what you mean, she said. Then how do you explain it? The inspector asked, turning to face her so sharply that the ends of his droopy mustache swung back and forth. How do you explain such a dramatic turnaround? She thought for a moment before replying. It's a long story, she said, but I'll share it with you. Mrs. Sun explained that her classes had been ordinary for the past five years, but had changed dramatically this year when they started looking at a unit on Asian history. Two children who were siblings, albeit in different age groups, suddenly developed a remarkably strong affinity for the subject. How did this happen? The inspector asked. Weren't you suspicious? No, their grandfather is a famous historian and archeologist, so their house is full of wonderful books and ancient artifacts. But you said the change began recently. Surely they haven't just acquired a new grandfather. No, I agree, that is a bit strange but I was delighted that they started getting good grades and the stories they shared with the other children triggered huge amounts of enthusiasm in them too. Everyone was playing history games on the playground every recess, so the whole class was benefiting. I believe the grandfather must have started teaching them at home. There was a knock at the door. Anya Modi, the art teacher, put her head around the edge of the door. Sorry to interrupt. She said, we're in a meeting, the principal said. I can see you later, Miss Modi. She held up her hand. Actually, I'm not here to ask for a meeting with you, sir, but I heard that the inspector was coming to talk about what's been happening with the school's exam results. I know the two children who are at the heart of the change very well, and I'm here to offer some insights. I'm Miranda's art teacher. Very well. In that case, do join us, the principal said, pointing to a chair. Now perhaps you can explain exactly how these two young people, let me see, uh, that would be Miranda and uh, Marcus. Marco and Miranda Lee, said Miss Modi. Their grandfather appears to be giving them some sort of practical history lessons. They'll focus on one particular era such as the building of the necropolis in the Xi'an in 210 BC, BCE, or the voyage of Zhang He's treasure fleet in Malaya in 1100 AD. They would read all the books and then they would play some sort of time travel game where a magic mirror, that's an artifact from ancient China, would take them back in time to that particular era where they would participate in the key events. The inspector sat up straight and narrowed his eyes. So they are receiving some outside help from their family members? Is the grandfather writing their homework for them? Certainly not, said Mrs. Sim. He's rarely in the country. He travels all the time. Besides, I can tell the difference between adult work and children's work. Mrs. Modi continued, what happens is that they seem to live in a different era for a while. You know how imaginative children can be? And then they come to school full of enthusiasm for the era they have just visited. The, the, the great thing is that they are so full of the tale that other children pick it up. And so do the teachers said Mrs. Sim in the art department. Anya has started to design classes around the same units of Asian history. The art teacher nodded. Yes, I'm doing them in parallel with Mrs. Sim's history classes, so everything falls in line. 
The English teacher is giving them creative writing exercises on the topic too. We've even managed to weave in the same themes into the math classes. Remarkable, said the, said the inspector. So the imaginary games of two children have infected several departments of the school in what seems to be a highly positive way. Anya Modi nodded. True, she said, but one thing you should note, the kids don't think of them as imaginary games. Miranda and Marco seem to really believe they travel back in time, and some of the kids believe them. The inspector looked concerned. I'm not sure that's healthy. Miss Modi stopped. It sounds very unhealthy to me. The short man continued, sitting up straight to make himself taller. The two teachers looked at each other. Both women opened their mouths at the same time. But the principal interrupted. Oh, of course it's, of course, of course. I don't think it's unhealthy. Can't you remember? being a child yourself, he glared at the inspector. Children can step into imaginary worlds as easily as they can step from one room to the other. Being able to blur the line between reality and imagination is one of the best things about being a child. Miss Modi smiled. I wish adults had brains. I wish they had brains that showed off half the openness and flexibility of children's. I suppose so, the inspector growled. Thank you so much for joining us. Hope you enjoyed the first two chapters of The Wall of Willows. And please join us for the next chapter. And in the meantime, catch up on our Raycraft YouTube channel and check out The Tomb of Time and you'll see the first couple of chapters of The Wall of Willows up there as well soon. Thank you again and look forward to seeing you next time.